What's up, world? I'm Matt Newberg from Hungary, and this is The Feed. Each episode, we'll dive into conversations with the industry insiders who are leveraging technology to shape the way we eat. On today's episode of The Feed, I sat down with Brad McNamara, founder and CEO of Morrissey Market, an online grocery platform built on top of the existing restaurant distributor infrastructure. In this episode, we'll talk about Brad's roots in vertical farming, how Morrissey is building online grocery as a service for food as medicine and nonprofit organizations, and the economics behind his asset light approach. Brad, it's awesome to have you here. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. I'd love for you to just start off talking about your background, um, starting in media into hydroponic, and then vertical farming, and then founding now what is Morrissey Market. Uh, it's a long journey there, but would love you know the high level story on on uh, your career so far um sure yeah i mean following the i guess chronological order of uh-huh. things um i like most people started my first jobs actually in food so i worked in grocery bagging groceries at a grocery store worked at an early incarnation of restaurant delivery called dining in uh okay. when it you know pre-smartphone I'm dating myself pretty bad right there <laughs> uh and then worked in uh, at a golf course as a greenskeeper and a mechanic in the shop so learned about growing plants and things like that but ultimately my real sort of adult career started in media like you said um i went to northeastern undergrad just did the co-op program there and ended up at a job at uh, a top 40 radio station here in the boston area working on the morning show there so Got to work in the morning from, you know, four to 11, then go to class from, you know, one to five. And it was a great few years there. Out of that, me and two friends ended up starting a marketing company um, based on CPG brands, beer, liquor, nightlife, some fashion brands that we grew uh, to six full-time people, about 250 uh, contractors at the time. Uh, Ran that for about six years before deciding to kind of change course go back to school, get a master's uh, in environmental science and an MBA in sustainability uh, around the time that I was becoming really, really, really interested in food production, hydroponics, kind of the hardware tech element of what was going on. And this was 2010 timeframe. Uh, so a long time ago there. And out of that ended up starting uh, my last company, which is called Freight Farms, you know, automated hydroponic farms inside of shipping containers. Uh, great fun journey there. Company still still alive, doing phenomenal work, uh, and ultimately led me or kept me in food, I should say, to Morrissey Market, where I got myself involved more, more and more in the unsexy side of distribution, access, and and moving perishable food versus growing it, and that takes us kind of to today. Amazing. Well, I'm really excited to dive into Morrissey um, and your unique model there, but. Real quickly, I'm very curious to learn a little bit more about Freight Farms. You know, going back over 10 years ago, like what was the problem you're trying to solve? Who are some of those customers? Um, and and kind of where are we at today in the world of vertical farming? Um, mm-hmm. I remember personally, I actually did get to a tour of a Freight Farms speci- um, customer, um, which is uh, Square Roots in Brook it was in Brooklyn at the time. I'm not sure if they're mm-hmm. still there, but that is uh, Kimball Musk's startup. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was amazing to see how they were able to dial in the various, um, you know, kind of vintages of of um, of like growing seasons and kind of you know recreate using LEDs and temperature control like certain vintages. And so I thought that was really cool and something that really stuck with me. But Kind of curious to get like a sense of where you were at at the time starting that company and kind of where it's at now. Yeah. Um, so the journey began, I mean, this was 2009, 2010. I was like most people who got into hydroponics, kind of a, a home grower, tinkering, growing my own lettuce and cucumber patches in a windowsill, that sort of thing. Uh, and wow. just became fascinated with the idea of moving food production closer to where people are. First, okay. investigated rooftop greenhouse as a possible option there, ran into a litany of issues that I didn't didn't feel like, nor did I think I could overcome. And uh-huh. then very quickly realized that there was some sort of macro waves happening in the space in terms of LEDs at the time, which it's, it's funny to think back to 2010, 2012 period, 
when there was still a debate as to whether you could actually grow food with LEDs. You know, that was yeah. There was a time frame and that was a question. Um, yeah. But at the time, it seemed inevitable to me that LEDs were continuing to get better, faster, cheaper. And mm -hmm. you know the heat signature and the flexibility of use and all the other things that they allowed were just phenomenal to me. So you marry that with you know, actuators and sensors were becoming, were on the same growth curve of better, faster, cheaper. Yeah. So it gave you better level of control and automation there and married with, you know, sort of the cloud compute element that continued to just, you know, again, get better, faster, cheaper. So there were yeah. these three elements that were just fascinating to me that pretty quickly having investigated rooftop greenhouse, it was very inaccessible to most people because each greenhouse, you know, very much was a custom build. It was kind of a snowflake in terms of once you got it dialed in, it was a unique element and you couldn't repeat it. So there was no ability to kind of short share data because there was no standardized kind of ha hardware platform to say, hey, I want to port this recipe. I want to port these settings hey. and have it be mm -hmm. sort of one to one. So, hey. you know, in 2012, 2013, you know, we actually did a Kickstarter campaign back when Kickstarter was this like small unknown thing. You know, we thought we were, we thought we were hot because we raised like 30 K to build a prototype. <laughs> uh, it turns out it costs way more than 30 K to build a uh, freight farms prototype. Um, yeah. so there were some credit card bills and whatnot to make that happen. But the main concept was to essentially leverage all the different technology and the well-established growing techniques. You know, the ability to grow indoors is nothing new, you know, Dutch have been doing it for, for decades and decades. Yeah. And so could we productize all of these different tech net tech and hardware elements so that more mainstream people could use it. And so the, the main driver was, and probably kind of still is, you know, allow anyone to grow food anywhere. You know, yeah. in 2012, that was still pretty groundbreaking as, uh, as a mission. And so, you know, we did that and just kept building and focused on the hardware, the software and how to make people farmers. You know, there's, this, this sort of pie in the sky idea that I that I have and still kind of have to this day that you know farming has become more and more centralized and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know what if we able, were able to use technology to empower more people to be farmers? It's the idea mm -hmm. of what's a better way to feed billions? Is it to make like ten even bigger farms or is it to make millions of people into viable farmers? I sort mm -hmm. of thought it was was the latter. Um, and so that's really why we started the company was, has been the whole mission ever since. And, you know, to this day, I mean, the company now, you know, has, we have farms on the network in, I think 49 States. And I want to say like 35 countries around the, around wow. the world. So I think at this point, still the largest network of connected farms wow. in the world. Amazing. Love that decentralized, um, approach and, um, very cool to hear how you started that. Um, all right, so let's get into the, the online grocery side of uh, where you are now. I'd love to hear, as a customer, if I live in you know your service area, tell, tell us why Morrissey Market is different from the likes of Instacart, Amazon Fresh, et cetera. I and mean, maybe you could talk about like the unique selection on there um, in some of the vendors you work with. You know, you mentioned a pasta company. I saw um, a very, delicious Detroit style pizza. I continually <laughs> bring this up on every podcast. I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, talk to us about that. Maybe the number of SKUs, how fast you're delivering, kind of just what's the customer facing uh, value prop? Yeah. I mean, the customer facing, the, the customer we really wanted to target, you know, somewhat selfishly is the millennial parent. So myself, my <laughs> co-founder, Tori, you know, most of the team were, were millennials. I've got a couple of young kids. You were kind of aged into this, this time and really wanted to create a grocery service for us, you know, in terms of we, you know, I'm slightly more foodie. My, my co-founder Tori has been in food distribution for 20 years, so she's very foodie. But all of our friends in this bracket kind of grew up with the farmer's market movement, where part of our weekend activities, I love going to farmer's markets and you know, the experience of being around food and the, you know, the variety and the quality. And ultimately we wanted to do two things, which was leverage the efficiency in the infrastructure that existed so that we could get really fresh, like farm fresh, high quality products to the door and then craft the whole experience to, to lighten the mental load for millennial parents whose time is, you know, just pulled in a million directions. You're trying to work, you're trying to live, 
now you're trying to raise kids and it's uh, truth be told it's very overwhelming uh and you know even when you're able to divide and conquer with a partner you know getting food and shopping the way you want is is difficult and so you know we we, we were very we've been very focused on the millennial parent and listening to them and building the skew and the the, the skew count and the inventory uh to cater to that so it's like we have a very curated selection in that you know, we're not going to have 12 SKUs of an idol we're going to have two maybe three and the bar that we internally set and talk to a lot of our customers about is we probably know too much about the food that we are able to procure and and get to our to our families but if we wouldn't 100 percent take it home to our families and feed it to our kids it doesn't go on the store so um yeah and i could i could totally see that from the the quality of the you know the various produce and and meat and and all the different uh, prepared foods all the way down to the pantry staples i mean how many SKUs are we looking at um and how fast are you you know delivering in your areas when you talk about like what you're where you're servicing right now yeah so we have just over a thousand SKUs in the store right now. Uh, we do next day delivery, um, so order by noon, and then you can we deliver it the next day. Uh, and we service right around eighty towns in the greater Boston area right now. So uh, our sort of power zone is that one twenty eight belt, uh, kind of suburban, peri urban uh, areas, mostly where you would find most likely high density of millennial parents. Mm-hmm. Makes a lot of sense. So I mean. Let's talk about, I mean, so I think what's really unique here, obviously it's a very high quality um, kind of selection that you have, but I think the most interesting part here is is actually how you're pulling this off. So I remember personally, uh, you know, in New York, I remember like distributors like Baldor, you know, that are supplying to some of the best restaurants decided, hey, we're going to start delivering, you know, we'll let you order at home because, you know, obviously restaurants weren't open. Um, We saw a lot of these distributors pivoting to home grocery and now it seems like they're back to their normal business. Um, So sounds like you've um, kind of adapted, you know, uh, adopted this approach. Um, So yeah, I'd love to hear about, you know, your co-founder, Tori, her background, how you kind of came together and you know, created this new model using these mm-hmm. wholesale distributors. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're spot on in terms of when the pandemic hit. You know, all all distributors that moved any type of perishable goods that were B two B had to find a place, had a home for that for that food that was going to go bad. So they all were forced into this D to C realm of figuring out a way to move food. Uh, and the distributors that I started to talk to were were not a were not dissimilar. You know, everybody did it. Everybody had to do it. Uh, what was kind of two things really inspired me. One, I had been obviously in food for a while, watched a lot of the innovation around food commerce, grocery generally, and how it was being done. And where I repeatedly saw things kind of fall down is at the end of the day, you know, food needs is a physical item that needs to be shipped and delivered very efficiently, you know, through procurement, cold chain, et cetera. Um, and what I saw was that these food service distributors that were mainly servicing restaurants, they had all the infrastructure and the expertise to do that. You know, they were doing that at volume every single day and really well, and they were making money doing it, uh, which was fascinating to me. And so uh, I connected with my co-founder, Tori, because she was running finance and operations, actually one of our, our host distributors, uh, Katsurubis Brothers in the Boston area. And... She just started to walk me through, you know, how their operation works and essentially open all the doors that no one ever gets to see behind in terms of how the, how things actually work. And we just immediately saw eye to eye in terms of, you know, there's an opportunity here to think about sort of grocery, perishable and grocery food delivery in a new way in that what we had seen built is sort of a new skin on the old system using the same supply chain, sort of layering in a, a layer of, of delivery, et cetera. Whereas here they weren't doing that, but they had really high quality supply chain. They had great skilled sort of pick and pack already stood up, you know, all these elements that were just, you know, structurally advantaged 
versus you know trying to build your own or build on top of uh, a different supply chain. And so we just kind of hit it off immediately. It also helps that I've known Tori for 20 years, and like I've known her and her family for a long time. So there's a high level of trust there. She was able to sort of open up her notebook of here are all the things I've been thinking about. Here's how I see this business model working, not working. You know, here's why we would never do this or could do that. And ultimately what it came down to was the the difference when it came to building Morrissey was the opportunity to build on top of the existing infrastructure that's there, the procurement, the logistics, the warehousing, and be a partner to the infrastructure players. So in that, I mean, when you look at institutional food service distributors, the restaurant distributors, their their operations run like a beehive from like 3 a.m. to 10 a.m. and then they kind of go to sleep. Huh. And what we're able to do is say, you already have all this infrastructure and it's state of the art, these great warehouses, these great refrigerated vans, et cetera. Why not work with us and let us you know, help you monetize that infrastructure? Where, so for Morrissey on the e-commerce side, you know, our customers get access to really high quality, really fresh, really efficient delivered food. And the distributor is now taking a cost center and turning into even break even or a profit center for the business. Really fascinating. Love that model. And I think this is uh, the meat of our discussion here. But like, love to hear, you know, kind of, um, what each party is like bringing to the table, right? So obviously you have to do all the customer facing, you know, demand generation to build, you know, what is considered, you know, a, a standard e-commerce grocery site that is consumer friendly and mm -hmm. market to customers and target them and, and keep them loyal. Um, but on when it comes to actually like warehouse operations and, you know, dry, delivering goods to customers, Who's doing what? And maybe you can peel back, you know, the onion a little bit on what what this partnership really looks like um, from an economic standpoint. Yeah. Uh, so the way the best way to think about it is the elements of their operation that we rely on. It's, you know, there's the physical element of pick and pack, get it into a van, get it to somebody's home. So the food service distributor already has these two elements. One, they call their repack area within the warehouse. So if you think about their operation as three parts, you've got that central part, which is a giant warehouse, you know, 125,000 square feet, five temperature zones filled with, you know, all this delicious food. At the back, you've got 20 and 40 foot trucks, which is where they make all their money. Because those trucks are going to the back door of all these restaurants five days a week, you know, f you know supplying all the things we eat when we go out to a restaurant. In that warehouse, they have a small corner called the repack area that if a restaurant miss orders or needs an extra pound of tomatoes or something like that, they call them up and say, hey, I need a pound of tomatoes. They have a team okay. there that will pull that case down, break it, pack it, and then it goes into a refrigerated sprinter van, uh. which is dropped off at the restaurant. Those two areas are strictly a cost center for them to maintain the customer uh. as part of the service that they provide to be a good partner to the restaurants but it doesn't make them money. And so what we saw was the fact that they already have the labor and the skilled labor to know how to pick high quality products and get them into, into boxes. They already have labor and drivers for the sprinter vans that are going out and running those routes anyway to access those. So what we really do is Morrissey kind of sits above their infrastructure and then utilizes their labor, their trucks, their infrastructure to uh -huh. execute the actual orders. Uh -huh. um, so the, the way it plays out is we built what we, what we call the Morrissey operating system, Morrissey OS that really sits above their infrastructure so that we can port you know, e-commerce orders into their pick and pack system. So their team picks them, packs them, labels them, gets wow. them ready for shipping. And then their team in there, the, the labor, the driver, the sprinter van, is it activated on like an hourly or a half day or a full day rate, depending on volume. So for the distributor, they say, this is great. I'm paying for that labor and for that truck all day anyway, but anytime, you know, most of the time it's sitting unused. So uh -huh. 
the dream for any business like that that has invested heavily in state of the art infrastructure is, you know, I would love 100% utilization of my assets, but you know that's not reasonable. But when they look at it and say, "Are my core business is only using 20% of that asset, if not if not less," then it's all upside to just use it, you know, a few days more, full day here and there, um, and that's where that's where the partnership really works well. Fair. So if I understand this correctly, you're basically using the margin of the products that you're selling to pay them some sort of negotiated rate for all these, you know, to, to essentially rent their labor and their some, some of their fixed assets. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what we do is we essentially stand up a, like a, a virtual pop-up shop inside of their warehouse to <laughs> immediately allow them to go from like pallet-sized orders to bag-sized orders. Right. And from trucks to vans and, you know, capture the mutual benefit. Mostly, you know, partially because we're buying through what we call the invisible wall. Because one of the elements we built allows us to have visibility into what's in our partner warehouses. So like where we do most of the, our physical inventory partner, pick and pack in Hyde Park, our other partner up in Newmarket Square, which both areas of Boston, for those that are familiar, you know, we get an order in from the, from the shop and take that order in. And then what we do is call pull through the invisible wall. If it's a pound of tomatoes, if it's a pound of strawberries, et cetera, we then pull that through the invisible wall and buy that from the wholesaler uh-huh. and then put it into the order. And then we also have a service agreement arrangement with them as well so that we can use their labor, their pick and pack, their vans, et cetera, on like a per order per, per, per hour kind of basis. Fascinating. Is it truly asset light approach to building something that is normally associated with raising hundreds of millions of dollars, if not mm-hmm. billions? And uh, yeah, it's just really interesting to hear. Um, I'd love to dive in a little bit more into like what you what you had to build from a software or technology standpoint. I mean, you mentioned the more COS. Let's talk about the different modules. Let's talk about everything from you know inventory management to the pick and pack to the uh, kind of last mile component and anything in in between that. Really curious to hear about that. Yeah, yeah. So again, you're you're spot on in terms of we didn't have to build anything physical, which has been really nice. You know, coming from my previous experience with Freight Farms, where we built you know, hardware, software, <laughs> everything from the ground up. You know, everything at Freight Farms we right. invented. You know, from every block up here. The ethos has been innovate, don't invent, because we know what we want to accomplish. We know there's great infrastructure. We know there's really uh, solid, you know, relationships, procurement techniques to make sure you're getting great pricing and high quality. You know, so don't reinvent the wheel there. So what we did, what we built in the Morrissey OS, the real sort of brain of it is very unsexy, um, to be completely honest with you. You know, we thought about, oh, you know, do, should we build front end? We're not a front end company. That's not our... That's not our strength. There are platforms that can stand up a really nice uh, front end experience, you know, be it a Shopify, a WooCommerce, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so we focused on a unique warehouse management system because the somewhat unique element is being able to work with the legacy systems of the institutional distributors because, you know, they're all pretty technical, albeit not always that modern. So that was a bit of a challenge was to build and integrate with some of their inventory management, their warehouse management systems, but most importantly, allow for that, what we call that invisible wall element of it, to have enough visibility into the inventory they have available, to have it on our store, but then also be able to purchase it and not have out of stocks and not be, you know, get sideways there. Uh, So that was sort of job number one. And, you know, that's where we create, like our brain is in that warehouse management system, which then allows us to I guess, be more strategic and somewhat thoughtful in terms of the other modules we're going to build. It gave us the ability, like when it came to last mile and routing and optimizations there, we could determine, you know, what's the best, you know, is it a plugin? Is it add on, you know, there, there's so many different options there. It's, it's really, it's really exciting to not have to build those things. Um, but just sort of pick the best one, optimize it, have it plug into our sort of brain. Um, and then do some small nuanced things around operational efficiency in terms of, you know, pick pack 
you know, a big, a big, a big aspect for me was packaging and waste and, you know, leveraging our advantage. So the fact that everything's cold store, you know, held cold, picked cold, and then put into a refrigerated van gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we think about packaging and just having food experts picking and packing, uh, who are used to, you know, selecting for chefs, you know, the fact that every piece of produce doesn't need to go into a separate plastic bag. It was kind of like a pet peeve of mine. If I would order <laughs> your grocery delivery, or you just said, guess we all, we we know what we're doing here. Let's sort of programmatize the fact that these things can go together. So if it's in a box, put them together. They don't need to go in a plastic bag. You know, these refrigerated elements need to be segregated, but you know, there's nothing, there's nothing more annoying from a customer perspective or from, you know, a business ops perspective when you see a box with what should be three cold packs and it has nine, <laughs> it's just like, that's crazy. So trying to optimize how the different products are packed together to minimize packaging, but keep the optimal temperature, uh, and then have a good customer experience. So those are the, those are the elements within it. Again, they're not very sexy, but where we spent a lot of our, our, our time and energy just to make sure we got the the ops tight and right for as we grow. Very fascinating, really cool. Um, something I was thinking about as you were describing this, especially from the sustainab sustainability angle, was the what seem seemingly lack of food waste on at least your side, right? Because you're buying it in real, t you know, you're buying it at the point where the customer right. essentially says add to cart. So it's just in time kind of inventory. You don't really have to like guesstimate how much is going to get bought or sold. That's kind of uh -huh. going to be, but that's still going to fall on, that's going to somehow be absorbed by the restaurant distributor partner, so to speak. Am I thinking about this right? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there, there's a, there's a couple of nuances in there that are really cool. And we've been ha having a great time exploring those is the balance of the volume business of the wholesaler where they, they, a wholesaler for a restaurant, you can't, you can't be out, you know, you can't run out. So they all, they, they've gotten really good at buying, buying enough, but always having a little extra and then always having secondary and third options to move the, move the food. You know, they're, they're very, very cognizant and good at waste management within the organization. Whereas on the, you know, retail side, you know, it's relatively smaller volume on a per item basis compared to their wholesale business. You know, so we're able to sort of tap into that steady flow, rapid turnover, high volume element of super high quality items um, and just sort of pull from there um, and, and manage accordingly. The other piece that's been exciting is bridging a gap in an issue that I saw at Freight Farms a lot, which was small farms that would you know, create a small following and then struggle at a certain point with distribution and access to customer. Because for instance, they would go to a wholesaler like a Katsurubis or a Shirazi, say, hey, I've got this great product. I'm growing in, you know, five freight farms. I'm really happy, you know, and I want to, I want to, I want to expand. A wholesaler says something like, oh, that's great. Let's try the product. This is phenomenal. My chefs will love this. Cool. I need 5,000 cases a week and we can, and we can talk. And, you know, a small farmer says, that's my planned production for the next like two years, <laughs> you know, like right now. So I don't know if this is going to work. And, you know, there's also price missing mismatches and things. What we've been able to do, you know, mostly to, for our customers, but, you know, for, for the farmers and producers as well is provide that volume match in terms of saying, Hey, like small freight farmer who's you know, located five minutes from my house. Let's get your product onto our retail shop let you v build up some volume, build your business. Because on the retail side, we have so much full control where if we run out, we can tell people right away to, hey, like good news, this local farmer, this kid that started his own farm and is growing, you have sold out. That's awesome. You know, tell us what you think of the product, keep buying, support them, you know, and they can build up their volume over time. And we sort of give them insight into, hey, these are the expectations that the wholesaler will have if you decide to go Say you go big and say, all right, I want to move to building a 50,000 square foot warehouse and I want to have a wholesale line and I want to have a retail line. You know, know the expectations, kind of step your way pragmatically into a big brand doing big volume. 
So then they could basically start selling to a restaurant. They could start with um, Morrissey and then eventually tab into Katsurubis' uh, restaurant customers, presumably. Yeah, yeah. And what's, you know, in Katsurubis, on the restaurant wholesale side, they get sort of a sneak peek into up and coming uh-huh. products and farms and things. And they can sort of, you know, sell that insight to their restaurant customers, say, hey, I brought you this thing. It's this hydroponic container farm that's based in Weymouth, you know, try <laughs> it out, enjoy it. Let me know what you think. I've got an in, you know, that sort of thing. And, and you know, kind of build up their own repertoire organically, you know, and, re- you know, in some ways, like it's a, it's a, you know, they're able to do on a, on a pragmatic step, step-by-step basis, you know, kind of what like a Square Roots would do and like partnering with like a Gordon Food Services, you know, but take out the need to build, you know, those full farms on site, you know, I'd say, I say like, there was always a dream on, on the freight farm side, which is still, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a plane in flight is a, you know, a distributed network of production that you have farms all over the area that are able to connect and sort of pool into distribution. You know, on the Morrissey side, it's been cool to see, like, we can start to bridge that gap a little bit and make that possible. Interesting. I'd love for you to zoom in a little bit more and talk to us about some of these purveyors. They seem really interesting and um, super high quality. Is there anything you can kind of share about some of those farms and some of those purveyors? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the examples you brought up, which is also one of my favorites, is the Detroit style pizza. <laughs> so I, I mean, I love the story just because it's, it's awesome. Um, so it's a father and son that the father was in sort of a multi unit restaurant world for a long time. Grew, you know, came up in the culinary arts, and just loved making pizza. And he loved Detroit style pizza. So he basically built a commercial kitchen in his like garage, and. It was like, you know what, in my spare time, my side hustle, I'm going to make these Detroit style pizzas <laughs> and start to sell them. And of course, like he had been a buyer and knew, you know, Tori and some of the cat's team, the cat's Rivers brother's team and came by, brought us some of the pizzas. We, you know, we, the frozen pizzas made in, made in his, his garage. We, we hated it all. We're like, these are phenomenal. These are so good. And so, you know, he was cooking pizzas in his garage with his son would only open like to the public for like an hour and a half every Saturday. We cook as many pizzas as he could during the week and sell like 300 pizzas in like two hours from neighbors, just like coming by word of mouth, buying pizzas from him. And so we worked with him and said, our customers are going to love these because they're so good. Let's get you on to Morrissey. Let's get it consistent. You can start to scale up and then let's talk about what else you want to make. And so he makes pizzas. He also makes us these phenomenal sourdough English muffins now because he was thinking yeah. about that. You know, so what we basically tapped into was the fact that, you know, we kind of have insight and ability to say, do what you love, you know, start with pizza, but you probably want to make other stuff. We know you have ideas in there and you have the skill to do it. Let's, you know, let's see what flies. Like we weren't entirely happy with our offering of English muffins. So we said, hey, do you have any ideas on English muffins? He said, I'll try some, we'll make some. Yeah, like we did that with him, which was, which was great. You know, we were able to stand up a, a protein program with a like a co-op of family farms up in Maine, which was really cool in that they didn't have a retail line, but Shirazi Distributing had a great relationship with them to, you know, basically procure really high quality cuts of grass fed uh, beef that they had on their, in the co-op up in Maine for some of his restaurant customers and knew that they had a small retail farm stand kind of line that they did locally similar to like, we'll just sell to our neighbors kind of thing that the pizza guys did. And basically said, Hey, your product is phenomenal. I think our customers would really, really love it. Why don't you do, why don't you have retail? And they said something along the lines of, we tried retail years ago. It's such a hassle trying to work with grocers. We just, we have a good thing here. We don't want to ruin it. And we want to focus on the quality of our farms and our farmers, but we do do a small retail pack. And so we basically said, well, one of our distributor partners is already already has a truck in the area every week anyway. If they'll do a drop and pick up at your location, would you run a small retail line for us of you know really good high quality proteins? And they're like, well, if you make it that easy, then sure. And so the distributor did that. We made it easy for them to come on. And if they sell out, great. You know, they can sort of up production on the retail side, and our customers get a really high quality product. 
I mean, yeah, I really love how you're breaking down kind of some of these barriers for, you know, really high quality, um, you know, sellers to to enter this this market by just make you know leveraging what they're kind of art what's already there. Um, that's really fascinating. So we we've been we've been talking about these two distributors, Shirazi and Katsarubis. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, but um, you know the. I would love to just zoom in a little bit more like on your relationship with them and Pre- talk about how this is kind of the template for future distributors in new markets under this Morrissey umbrella. I guess talk to us about mm-hmm. this um, this vision. Like, how are you guys working together now? It sounds like these two distributors are feeding a singular service. There's not They're not like one distributor for each area. Um, right. What they're bringing to the table separately, like is it different types of SKUs or where do they specialize? And then maybe talk about how you envision this becoming the model going forward for other distributors, like how many distributors you would need in a market, what mm-hmm. your value prop would be to them, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot, a lot in there. So I'll try to try to pick it apart and just course correct me as I go, if I get off, if I get off course here. Um, so the, the, the concept is to partner with a few distributors in a region to, provide fulfillment. So, you know, the Morrissey, what we call the Morrissey OS internally sits above that infrastructure, has the warehouse management, the invisible wall, you know, accessing, you know, their excess capacity, labor, vans, et cetera, to fulfill orders. You know, and we do that in a few ways. We have our e-commerce brand, Morrissey Market, but then we also allow others to plug into our back end. So like we do fulfillment for a nonprofit food insecurity uh in the Boston area where they stood up their own uh e-commerce site to do their to execute their mission. The biggest problem was the need is huge and they couldn't they couldn't keep up with their facility because they're not made for fulfillment. They were made for engagement and for and for community development. And so they point those orders to us that we run fulfillment. What we've been figuring out here in Boston is, you know, exactly what does that template look like? You know, the idea is we have one to two core distributor partners that act as sort of that more central in that area. So, you know, where we would sort of focus our energy and get started. The way we set it up in Boston is Katsarubis Brothers, like really long Greek name. That took me a while to learn how to say correctly. <laughs> um, you know, they are sort of our central partner. Shirazi Distributing is you know six miles away, but depending on traffic, uh, can be a real a real pain in the Boston area. Uh, you know, they they do have overlapping areas, but they have specialties. So, for, you know, Katsurvis Brothers is bigger, uh, and is strong in fruit and produce, and has a wide variety of SKUs, everything from sodas to cereals, pantry staples, etc. Shirazi has phenomenal sort of dairy, cheese, and some premium meat contacts uh, that just requires a different network. And they've been cultivating those relationships for 60 years, uh, somewhere in that vicinity. Then as we expand, we basically are able to do what is already done in the industry. So distributors, you know, on overlapping regions and in different parts of, of an area will collaborate and like cross stock with each other. So, you know, our distributor partners have explained how this all works. It's this web of, oh, you're in central Maine. Hey, I'm trying to, I'm trying to service a customer that's in, you know, North central Maine. It's too far for me. Can I have, you know, a certain amount of uh, product dropped at your warehouse and then cross docked at your facility to then make the last, you know, 40 miles to this, to this customer. You know, so there's a lot of coordination in there that's already inherent. It's already happening every day. Um, and so really what we've focused on is building that more COS to sit above and then be able to say, okay, let's activate these partners to fill the gaps, you know, because the fact is that like, you know, we realized while there are, you know, 4,000, four to 5,000 distributors of this kind of strata of the Katsurubis brothers, the Shirazi distributing size and type in the country, you know, they're all slightly different. So we do have to have some flexibility and be able to kind of mix and match a little bit to make sure that when we go to Chicago, DC, Detroit, Phoenix, and partner, 
you know, that we're able to sort of say, okay, this is what we need to have. Okay. This is how we can fill that gap, um, you know, and build that out if that makes sense. And it'll all be branded Morrissey market in these new areas and it'll be in partnership with XYZ distributors. I mean, no, in select markets, it'll be what we do here in Boston, which is Morrissey market powered by Katsurubis brothers and Shirazi. Um, in most markets, you'll never really know about Morrissey, uh, okay. from a brand perspective. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of, like I said, like the, the core of the business isn't that sexy. Like the branded, uh, grocery delivery is customer facing and, you know, quote unquote sexy, but what's really powerful is what we offer to, uh, like nonprofits, food as medicine programs, all these other outfits that need this type of fulfillment. Uh, at scale and speed. Uh, and so that's like our back end as a service, which, you know, truth be told has sure. been you know, really driving growth the last couple months for us as word of mouth has gotten out. Fascinating. So when you, if you go into a new market, what it's going to go under the distributors brand. So they'll be just, they'll just turn on a customer facing e-commerce site. Possibly. I mean, in a lot of ways, what's exciting is that it's up to the appetite of the distributor partner. So because Morrissey will act as like that pop-up that enables pallet to bag fulfillment, truck to van, you know, we can coordinate on, okay, we've got a national food as medicine contract that needs to be fulfilled. So God. we can stand this up, we'll run fulfillment. The food as medicine program and the end, the end consumer there doesn't really care you know, if it's branded as Morrissey or branded as the distributor, they just want right. to make sure they get high quality, sure. you know, uh, food. That that pop up that module allows for the distributor to say, actually, yes, like I loved this business when I did it out of necessity during the pandemic, but it was a completely different business that required a whole different set of processes and tools. Okay, you've built that that tool set for me. Snap it back in, turn it on. You know, it's one of the reasons we started with the e-commerce as the kind of tip of the sword for the business is far first to inform what should be built and what really matters. And also to build some playbooks for possible distributor partners in the future who said, you know, Hey, like, you know, turning on, you know, a direct consumer site to, you know, utilize my assets is great for me. and something I want to do to diversify. Yeah. So we'll, you know, sort of share that playbook with them of like, here's how we did it in Boston. Here's how we did customer acquisition you know, roughly here's what like we see as like a good AOV, here's what we see as good density, you know, but everyone, each local sort of distributor will have different, you know, business goals, you know. Got it. So it sounds like they're not going to be competing with Instacart when they, when they expand, when you expand to these new, you know, these new markets, you're going to be working more quietly with these various orgs. They're tackling everything from food insecurity to, you know, uh, healthcare and related, um, subsidies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're from the beginning for us building something that enabled sort of the future of food commerce with Bradley, how we were thinking about it and spent some time talking about it was kind of beyond where we are with how people buy food today. You know, we're still in that zone of building on top of the, the, the grocery infrastructure as it exists. And you know, the more and more that we see, you know, I think even like you, you had a guest on from, I think it was cooking, mm -hmm. you know, the way people are monetizing their passion for food and the culinary arts is evolving and changing. And where I see us fitting is kind of quietly behind the scenes, building infrastructure and a platform for more and more people who want to find a way to monetize their passion around food. Mm -hmm. who don't want to go become a chef, run a restaurant, you know, certainly don't want to become a celebrity chef, you know. Or, or write cookbooks, you know, they want to, you know, engage an audience, share their passion with what they're making, and then have a way to, you, you know, scale to a certain extent and distribute that product. Really fascinating. I, I'd love for you to share any kind of the, I really think it's important to underscore, you know, what, what you're able to achieve with this asset light approach versus a pure play online grocer that would have to, you know, stand up all these warehouses from scratch, hire zillions of engineers to build a right code from scratch. I mean, literally, Truth. like you said, reinvent the wheel. Talk to us about like your advantages, like your efficiencies there, then maybe talk about some of the unit economics or like paybacks that you're going to have as a result of this kind of lighter approach. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the the premise is as old as tech in a lot of ways. You know, look at existing existing plumbing and build on top of it. You know, you had like Netflix did so with like first the the postal service, and then as broadband came online to yeah. to, to to double down on streaming. You know, even like you know, a local company like Kayak here that essentially did a really nice UI on top of an existing you know travel search database that was available to you know everybody at the time. And, you know, thinking about it from that perspective, you know, is to really, you know, you know, leverage that. And so when we think about the, the economics, you know, we are able to, you know, scale up, but with flexibility. So the biggest, the biggest element when we were starting the e-commerce was testing how many SKUs we should have, what should the makeup be like? Are there curated boxes that will resonate with customers? Every time we made one of those changes or iterated, it wasn't an operational fire drill because that's super easy for us. You know, building uh, the company from the day from day one with operational excellence around perishable foods and grocery items made all those iterations really easy. So we weren't rebuilding anything. And the other side is buying like direct, like inside of the wholesaler, who's also going as direct as possible. Oftentimes, you know, like buying directly from Driscoll's and Watsonville and having you know forty foot you know, uh, trucks sent directly wow. it gives us tremendous pricing power so that when we ship like an e-commerce order, you know, we have in the vicinity of 30% margin on that order, you know, and, you know, as of today, you know, also have positive contribution margin with this, this on the e-commerce side, you know, on the back end as a service orders that we fulfill, same thing, but the margin's a little bit better. So, you know, it allows us to get to a point where, like, I mean, what we're really proud of is since we sort of took this to market with e-commerce and back end as a service in October, November of last year, we were able to hit a million dollar run rate in March with pipeline to get to two in under six months. And that's on existing infrastructure. So we don't need to invest another, you know, $50 million to stand up a new warehouse and fulfill that, you know, we will be able to get to in the vicinity of $20 million run rate without even really taxing the existing, you know, partnership infrastructure we have. That 20 million is just from the, from Morrissey's existing footprint you're yep. talking about? Yeah. Wow. And maybe, so you said something about like the back end uh, as a service. Uh, so that I'm assuming that these are like more the um, organizations that just need to um, place orders for, you know, nonprofit food distribution that you said was more profitable than the consumer facing side because you just less customer service and less kind of overhead there. Or where yeah, is I, mean, that for, from? I mean, for us as a, as a corporate entity, you know, what's really nice is the part, everybody can play their part and just get really good at it. So like on our nonprofit where we do fulfillment for their grocery and their online sh shop, you know, they're really good at where the customers are doing customer acquisition, engaging uh. with them, educating, communicating. We're just doing what we do really well, which is fulfillment for them. So, you know, we're not taking on the cost of all that acquisition and customer service and whatnot, you know, and, you know, they're also, you know, the, oftentimes have a, a, le, like a, a more limited skew count. So one of the food mm -hmm. is medicine programs that we're onboarding. It's, it's very prescribed boxes. You have to get, they've got seven boxes, everything from like mm -hmm. a pre-diabetes box to a hypertension box, you wow. know, that we're able to fulfill for them. You know, for us, it's, you know, that's very easy and becomes very, very efficient when you've got seven types of box with all the same things in them so that we turn on our partnership power around procurement and efficiency of packing. Um, so the margins are good, but mostly it comes around, it comes back to, you know, acquiring customers is really hard and very expensive, you know, but so is, you know, fulfillment and scaling that up. And uh -huh. so where, where we you know, live because it's our expertise is offering our partners the opportunity to focus on the customer, focus on acquiring them, servicing them and understanding them to the best of their ability and marketing to them. And then we can fulfill, you know, not at infinite scale, but go much, much faster, much more efficient and much higher quality than they would if they tried to do it on their own. It's the same thing as trying yeah. to start a startup before right. AWS where Amazing. you're hiring a whole backend team to just stand up a server and you're like, that's not our business. Our, our business is on servers. You know, our business isn't building this customer facing app or this B2B service. 
and, and, you know, so that's what we're really starting to build and, and becoming for the industry. Really, really interesting. It doesn't, a zillion light bulbs are going off in my head, but for lack of a better analogy, I would say like, you know, the same thing that we saw with the restaurant world getting into virtual brands and like the Mr. Beast burgers, right? Like mm-hmm. it sounds like I could have my own grocery delivery service within a few weeks or months. Uh, if a hu- hungry prescribed uh, diet, mm-hmm. if I wanted to promote, you know, gut fr- gut friendly foods or something, um, I could stand that up, become like a sh- like an influencer, focus on all the acquisition, all the customer yep. service, and then just hand hand it off to you to like actually do all the heavy lifting. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a future we're going to be living in, like you said, in just a few years. I mean, it seems far fetched right now, but. It's happened quickly. I mean, we've seen it with like Shopify, Amazon, Amazon fulfillment for all of the, you know, influencers or sort of this creator to commerce movement of durable goods. You know, why not food? And I mean, we know this. Uh, like, food people are, um, what's the right word? Borderline zealots when it comes to like their passion for food in all the good ways. Uh, you right. know, and so those of us that are in food. We'll talk about food. We'll be around food. We'll, we'll we'll just explore the space forever. And so there's so many valuable kind of niches and business opportunities within that, that, you know, to think that like I or like the team at Morrissey or like, you know, anybody else could like figure out all the best iterations. You know, uh, I've, I've always gained more enjoyment by empowering others and just saying, hey, like, what are you going to think of? You know, what are you going to build that we can, you know, help you make happen. And that's you know, probably one of the most exciting parts of the jury with Morrissey has been able to sort of say, that's that's what I love to do. And that's what we're able to build. Really love that. That's really cool. Uh, can you share any list, any names of any of these um, kind of food as medicine companies or uh, nonprofits that you've been working with uh, that we may have heard of? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the food is medicine players are a little under wraps right now, but on the nonprofit side, I mean, they're phenomenal organizations. So, you know, one of our, one of our biggest is, uh, the fresh truck. So it's this, it's a company about fresh out of Boston done c- phenomenal work. They, you know, started with the fresh truck, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, which is a retrofitted school buses that you'll know, bring a mobile farmer's market into underserved neighborhoods. Uh, you know, have grown that business. They stood up an online store to do the same thing at scale. They also actually, they actually have a tech company within them, which is really phenomenal called Fresh Connect to sort of disrupt and sort of give power back to the people around SNAP, EBT, uh, and healthy eating. So it's a really phenomenal organization. We've been able to help uh, a number of boys and girls clubs who have food programs because the sad reality was, you know, during the pandemic and ongoing, you know, they were, they were funded to get food to the families that they serve, but the back end was a mess in that they'd end up using this money to go to like a Costco, buy processed okay. foods, interns would break it up into bags and they give it to families. And it was the best that they could do, like nothing wrong with it, but they just didn't have access to what Morrissey was. So they couldn't fulfill, you know, fresh healthy, mm-hmm. you know, whole foods to those families, although that's exactly what they'd want to do. So we were able to bring them on and support them in that respect. Yeah. You know, so like, those are a couple of the customers that, are, you know, it's fun. It's fun. It, it feels right. Um, and it, it's making a good difference. Really cool. And then just real quickly that the business model for that, how is it different than being the kind of like the merchant of record with Morrissey market? Um, you just charge a rev share or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, we end up essentially productizing all the things that they were struggling to do with a higher quality product. So replace them sending staffers, team, and interns to Costco and buying processed foods. Yeah, we Mm -hmm. just fulfill grocery orders. And then, you know, we're able to sell them the grocery order boxes um, at a a good cost. So, you know, the equivalent of them, if they tried to or wanted to send their team to the grocery store, They'd pay, they'd pay substantially more than we are able to charge them. And they would still have to do all the labor of going to shop for it, pack it, store it, and deliver it. Amazing. So uh, as we're kind of coming towards the end of the convo, I'd love to kind of look towards the future and ask somebody who is so well entrenched in this space, kind of any predictions you have around, you know, this kind of tension between like marketplaces like DoorDash and Instacart um, and Uber's corner shop against like some of these first party 
online grocers like a you know Amazon. Um, I guess you could throw Walmart in there. Um, <laughs> even then on the convenience side, GoPuff, which has like you know five thousand SKUs um, plus alcohol, or I guess that includes alcohol. But um, yeah, get, just general thoughts on that, and maybe any thoughts on like where this penetration is going. You know, we're at somewhere north of like ten percent now. Um, it's definitely going a lot slower than we expected. I, I saw reports that were saying that we'd be at like 18% by now or something <laughs> yeah. insane. Yeah. But yeah, any, any just general like five to 10 year views on, on kind of any of those things I mentioned would be great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean like five to 10 year view. I mean, I think like we, like we kind of touched on the, the entire ecosystem around monetizing food and the passion for food is going to look dramatically different in 10 years than it does today. I think because of you know, what Morris is doing and with a lot of other, uh, you know, be it, be it chef, be it cooking, be in these other platforms that are emerging, you know, to, to, to try and empower people to monetize their passion around food. So I think I can't even begin to predict what that's really going to look like and what the creative things people are going to be doing in terms of, you know, the legacy players, you know, Amazon, Walmart, you know, I think they're, you know, they're always going to have a place, you know, in the grocery, uh, space, you know, they're not going anywhere. Um, you know, the others, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, you know, be it, you know, uh, Instacart, you know, I think Uber Eats and DoorDash, you know, have a nice, have a good business in the restaurant delivery space where they're doing well, uh, groceries much tougher, um, you know, so I would, I would see Instacart, you know, you know, when people ask, like, are you competing with Instacart? You know, no, in that, you know, if I'm Instacart, I'm thinking, you know, my grocery infrastructure that I source from is more and more going to want the customer relationship back. So if they're not being, you know, sort of gently removed from the, from the grocery stores, they're going to be kicked out. So at a certain point, I'd imagine they're going to want to look to go more direct and source fulfillment and then try uh. to be that, you know, customer acquisition layer, uh, on top. In which case, if that's the evolution, you know, they're a great partner for, for somebody like a, like a Morrissey uh. um, to work with them on fulfillment. Um, but I think, you know, we're kind of, like you said, I mean, there was that accelerated adoption because of the pandemic and everyone was saying, you know, we're going to be at 18, no 20%, you know, <laughs> by like 2023, you know, which would be great, but it's not the world we live in. Um, but I think that it's not going backwards, you know, so we will get there and that's going to mean, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of changes, um, where I think we'll start to see, you know, similar to any other, you know, emerging industry and, and growth sector, you know, like indoor ag's no different, you know, where like everybody's doing everything all at once. Then a few people decide, no, it makes sense to focus uh, and be, you know, really good at one or two things and leave everything, leave the other elements to other companies and then partner on it. You know, we're going to have that same level of shakeout. You know, the, the difference here being that a lot of the players in the space have gotten a lot bigger um, over the last like three or four years than, you know, we've seen in other spaces. So kind of we're in the we're in the early innings, I would say, but it's going to be an exciting few years. Amazing stuff all around. I, I definitely learned a lot. So thank you so much for for coming on the show today. Uh, really great to to um, see all these different sides that I hadn't really thought about before when it comes to the future of online grocery. So so thanks again for that. Um, I'd love to just give you a few a moment a, a moment here to just plug away for anyone listening who let's just say. Uh, consumers that are in the in your service area that want to try Morrissey, uh, people who are, I guess you would call them like um, influencers or even nonprofits or any kind of back end partnerships, and then maybe wholesale distribution partnerships, people who are interested in being kind of your supplier, those kind of three um, different sides of the marketplace. How do they get uh, in, in touch with you or how do they find you online? Um, yeah, I mean, best place is just. Brad at morrisseymarket.com, you know, or, you know, look me up on LinkedIn, I suppose, you know, active, active in, in both those places. And yeah, I mean, right now, really, really looking at food as medicine partners and what everybody's looking at for fulfillment there. Um, cause we are getting a bunch of inbound. And so, you know, looking to find a, a few forward thinking, uh, partners who can help us sort of work through how to be, how to be a good partner in this sort of like food health nexus. Great to hear that um, you're part of that change and um, really, really uh, fascinating stuff all around. Thanks again uh, for coming on, Brad, and uh, looking forward to see, seeing where this all heads over the next few years. 
Thanks a lot. This is fun. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you're curious to get a firsthand look at the cutting edge of food and tech, check out Hungry.tv. That's Hungry with No You, where you can join in on live conversations like these or sign up for the free weekly newsletter.